the last two lectures we have been talking about forecasting and various methods of forecasting. As you all know the forecast of demand is a very important input to the planning exercise and in today's lecture we are going to be talking about utilizing demand forecasting for purposes of aggregate production planning. Aggregate production planning is the exercise of developing a overall plan for a company which specifies how resources of the company are going to be committed over the next 6 months to 1 year. So, the typical planning horizon that we are talking about is a planning horizon up to about 1 year. And in this particular lecture we are going to be talking about some of the basic concepts of aggregate production planning and uh, we will see how aggregate production planning is actually useful for a company. This is the basic definition of aggregate production planning. So, if you see aggregate production planning is basically concerned with planning overall production. The emphasis is on overall production of all products combined and this overall production could be in tons of steel, liters of paint etcetera and we are talking about a planning horizon generally next 3 to 6 months or even extending up to a year for a given forecast demand schedule. So, the basic idea here is that the demand for the various products of a firm could be fluctuating and if the demands are fluctuating how do we commit our resources to meet this fluctuation in the demand that is the basic intention. Uh, I think a word about why we call it aggregate production planning and how is aggregate production planning different from production planning within the context of a factory. You see for a planning horizon for the next 6 months or 1 year the company is basically interested in knowing how the overall performance of the company shall be as the demand keeps on fluctuating. So, a company might be manufacturing let us say hundreds of products. The demand for one product may be going up, the demand for the other product might be coming down and as far as the hundreds of products are concerned each demand would exhibit its own kind of behavior. So, if the company tried to track the performance of these individual products it could probably go mad in tracking the demands of the hundreds of products which are there. And since the company is interested only in the overall growth and the overall commitment of resources for the next one year therefore, it is interested in aggregating the <coughs> demands of the individual products and talking about the aggregate production plan rather than talking about individual production plans. So, if you are talking about a steel plant for instance, a steel plant could be manufacturing sheets, scalp, various types of ingots of different sizes, rail sections strips in a variety of sections. So, you would have a large variety, but when the managing director of the steel plant wants to know how the steel plant would be performing over the next year, he would probably be concerned about the total production in terms of tons of steel of all types of products put together. So, tons of steel would be a convenient aggregate measure of the performance of the company and you could then aggregate the demand of all the products in terms of the total tons of steel and use this as an aggregate measure of the requirements of the company. Similarly, if you are talking about a paint manufacturing company, a paint manufacturing company produces paints in different colors, different sizes and for different applications and for each of those 
paints the demand would be different. But if you want an overall idea of how the paint manufacturing company is performing, you could probably aggregate the total requirement of paints and say what is the total liters of paint requirement for the whole company as a whole. This concept could be extended to even an automobile manufacturer for instance. If you talk about an automobile manufacturer, let us take the typical example of Maruti Udyog for instance. The company produces different types of cars, it produces a Maruti 800, it produces a Zen, it produces a van, it produces a gypsy, it produces a Varsa and so on. It produces different types of cars and the demand of these cars will be different over the planning horizon of the next one year. But if the company is trying to find out what would be its growth level for the next one year, it could probably try to mix up the demand of all these cars. Now, how would it mix up the demand? It could probably have to think in terms of a unit like standard passenger units, standard passenger cars. So, maybe they might say that a Maruti 800 is like 0.8 of a standard car a Maruti Zen is like one standard car, an esteem is like 1.2 standard passenger units and develop some units like this and then ultimately measure the performance of the company in terms of standard car units and something like this and then it would have an aggregated variable which would be able to deal with this. So, the point that we are trying to say is apart from this uh, aspect of focusing on the overall growth. The second major advantage of using aggregating uh, or aggregating the demand is that the normally if you have 50 products and you make their forecasts and then you try to uh, work with individual forecasts, each forecast will be subject to some errors. And if you try to combine these forecasts, the aggregate demand figure would be subject to much less error because the positive and negative errors will tend to randomly cross each other out and therefore, there is greater accuracy in obtaining the aggregate demand forecast than the individual demand forecast. So, this is another reason for dealing with aggregate production planning. So, the whole process in aggregate production planning is essentially to determine the aggregate forecast first. So, you do a process of aggregation, do aggregate production planning. Once you have done it, you will have to disaggregate it to obtain, obtain the individual uh, pattern of uh, demands or rather production levels for individual products in that sense. So, I think uh, this perception of aggregate production planning must be kept in mind. Basically, what are we trying to do in aggregate production planning? Basically, what we are trying to say is we are working with the forecast of demand and we are trying to work out the capacities, cost and commitments that you are making. So, you know that this is the capacity of my plant so much in January, so much in February, so much in March because you might have committed capacity to other products. So, the capacity availability in different periods is known. So, you know the various types of costs that are incurred and you are therefore, trying to find out how these capacities should be committed to the aggregate demand over a certain period of time and this is what we call an aggregate production plan. From the aggregate production plan, we are then able to work out the workforce requirement over the planning period and we are also able to determine the machine time allocation over the planning horizon. So, basically this is the purpose of aggregate production planning in trying to determine the commitments of the capacity to the various products. We have already indicated that the basic problem in aggregate production planning that we are trying to solve is the problem of meeting a fluctuating demand. 
if you were sure for instance that the demand in each month is going to be 100 units and this will continue ad infinitum then production planning will be a relatively simple affair but that is not what happens in practice in practice demands keep on fluctuating you have to forecast these demands and therefore let us be clear about the options that management has to meet fluctuating demand in any business how can it meet a fluctuating demand probably the first method and one that is uh, used quite commonly in industry is to build inventories in slack periods in anticipation of higher demands later in the planning horizon so you can uh, keep on building inventories when there are no sales in the hope that some future you will be able to sell off the inventories that you have made this could be a good strategy provided the demands actually show up in the future but if you have been able to if not been able to forecast the demands properly then this could be a risky strategy you probably are aware that in the maruti factory in gurgaon at one stage they had such a large stock of cars that they had to procure additional land to just store these uh, finished cars outside and so much so that the cars were actually getting uh, damaged in the adverse weather conditions in which they were being stored so this strategy of uh, using inventories in slack periods in anticipation of higher demands may work in practice but it is not without its problems the other option could be that you could carry back orders or tolerate loss sales during peak periods do you know the difference between a back order and loss sales a back order is something when the customer comes to a shop and you don't have the item in stock and uh, he places an order with you and he is willing to wait so whenever you are able to supply you give him the order so that is called back ordering a loss sale would be that a customer comes to your shop and he finds that you don't have the brand of shampoo that you need and therefore he just walks away to some other shop and that is a loss sale so both loss sales and back orders are actually situations which occur when there is a shortage when you do not have enough stock available of whatever item is demanded so whenever the stock level is positive you build inventories whenever the stock level is negative you either carry back orders or tolerate loss sales in that sense the third option that management may have to meet a fluctuating demand is to use overtime in peak periods under time in slack periods to vary output while holding workforce and facilities constant this is a very common strategy isn't it this is the kind of strategy that students typically tend to use uh, when there is a peak period that is five uh, assignments are to be submitted they work overtime at night and get these uh, assignments ready and otherwise uh, when there is a slack period they uh, do not I mean they they use under time in slack periods they do not work and uh, that is the way they vary their output and while holding the workforce and facilities constant I think another point that needs to be mentioned in the context of uh, aggregate production planning is that normally we are not talking about the option of increasing uh, or uh, machinery and other kind of infrastructure within your plant for instance if there is a need if there is an increased demand for something one option might be to set up another factory now, we are not talking about those capital intensive options in this particular situation because our planning horizon is typically one year ahead so we are talking about those options in which generally the facilities are constant though of course workforce can be varied in general.
The other option available to the uh, manager for dealing with fluctuating demand is you can vary the capacity by changing the size of the workforce through hiring and firing. It is a very common strategy these days, right. You probably heard or read a couple of days ago about Cadbury's uh, laying off something like 20,000 workers all over the world, right, in their various plants. So, they are adopting this strategy of changing the size of the workforce through either hiring or firing. So, most of the companies fire their workforce and when there is a need you can always hire the workforce. Okay. So, changing the capacity by hiring and firing is a very common strategy. It is actually a capacity that has it is a kind of a uh, contract labor. That is right it could be contract labor. Night, for instance, most farmers would engage additional labor when they require th them for purposes of uh, reaping the harvest, and then when they don't need them, they would fire them. Right? This kind of thing is uh, so. That's exactly that. But hiring and firing, as a typical term, as a uh, normal uh, in normal parlance, uh, is the legacy of the American culture. The American culture of people are very fond of hiring and firing. Right? You find that an executive is doing very well, he is given a promotion today, but when he comes to work next Monday, he finds that there is a pink envelope on his uh, desk which says, thank you Mr. Ralph, you are fired today because we do not need you and uh, here is your check for whatever number of days you have served us. This kind of culture prevails more in the United States, not in India as much, though of course, the uh, with the advent of the multinationals and so on, this kind of culture is also coming into being the hire and fire culture. But normally, when you talk about uh, employment in the typical government of India, there if you are hired once, you are fired only when you, when retire. you retire, isn't it? That kind of a situation. But then, this is an option available to management for changing capacity by changing the size of the workforce through hiring and firing. I would like to mention here that hiring and firing is not without its costs. When you hire people, you have costs of hiring that is the process of selecting people, conducting an interview, training people before they actually become productive. So, these costs are the costs of hiring and similarly, when you fire people, there is a cost associated with firing as well. You are there is loss of customer goodwill and the loss of customer goodwill would mean that uh, the person whom you have fired will probably spread the message in other organizations do not ever join this company because they hardly keep you for 2 weeks and then fire you or something like that. So, that reputation travels. So, there are costs associated with hiring and firing and one of the major purposes in aggregate production planning is actually considering these various costs which are associated with these various options and try to select a strategy which is the optimum strategy in terms of meeting the fluctuating demand. You can vary the capacity through changes in plant and equipment, but generally as I said this is the long term option and is not considered when you are talking about aggregate production planning. Okay. So, the point really is that each option that we have considered here involves cost, the cost may be tangible or intangible cost and the aim in aggregate production planning is to choose the best option considering the various costs. So, it is essentially an optimization problem with these types of costs fluctuating costs and the kinds of constraints that we have just tried to mention. So, before we talk about the problem involved, let us try to identify the kinds of costs which are there in a typical aggregate production planning. One of the major costs involved is procurement cost, right. So, whenever you are producing, you have a typical uh, option of either uh, buying the material or producing the material. In either cases, procurement is to be made, right. You can either buy the material for 100 rupees 
and then process it within your factory or you can procure the item maybe for 500 rupees whatever it is. So, costs of procurement have to be taken into consideration and the costs of procurement in fact all these costs could be fluctuating or varying with the time period over the planning horizon. Then you have costs of production, <coughs> cost of producing a piece in the first period might be 100 rupees, in the next period it might be 110 rupees and then it might be constant at 110 rupees a piece and then it might go up again in the sixth period to something else. Inventory holding costs, the inventory holding cost is that cost by which if you produce something in a certain period, whatever is not consumed will have to be held for that particular period and that is the inventory. So, there are costs of storage, costs of spoilage, cost of pilfering etcetera. These are basically all aspects of inventory holding costs and uh, typically one of the most common components of inventory holding costs is the uh, loss of interest on the capital that you have invested. For instance, if I stock something worth 1000 rupees, if I had kept that 1000 rupees in the bank or given it to somebody else, I would have been able to earn some interest on it, but by holding it in inventory in the form of a car or a whatever product I have, I have actually foregone any uh, returns on that particular product. So, this is actually uh, what we mean by saying that there are always inventory holding costs, shortage losses associated with back orders and lost sales. So, depending upon the situation that is if you are not able to supply an order because you do not have the quantity ready with you, then you incur a shortage and the shortage losses could be in the nature of back orders. So, in a back order the cost would be in terms of rupees per unit per unit time right because you are satisfying the demand at a later point of time, but for a loss sale it is a one time loss. So, it will be like so many rupees per units lost the element of time would not be there in loss sales. So, that would be the unit of a back ordering cost and a loss sales. Then we talk about costs of increasing and decreasing the workforce. These are typically the hiring and firing costs that we were talking about. If you increase the workforce, the cost of uh, employing additional people, training them and uh, bringing them up to the mark, so that they can contribute effectively to your process, that is the cost of increasing the workforce. Cost of decreasing, decreasing the workforce could be the cost of idle capacity or it could also be the cost of uh, loss of goodwill. So, these types of costs are involved. Then we have the cost of overtime and under time, cost of changing production rates what can happen is that there could be setups, there could be opportunity losses etcetera and these are the costs of changing the production rate. For instance, if you are producing at a certain level in the month of January and you decide to change the production rate in February, it would either mean that you have to change some setups, make some new adjustments in your plant and uh, that is the kind of uh, setup cost that you have here and or there could be some kind of opportunity losses as a consequence of these kinds of decisions. Let us now take a simple example to show how aggregate production planning could be done. Suppose that we have uh, data on demand for the next let us say one year. So, during the first period the expected demand is 100 and I also have a cumulative demand figure which tells me what is the cumulative demand up to the end of that period. So, in the second period the demand is 180, the cumulative demand is now 280 and so on 
in the third period the demand is 220. So, this added to 280 will give me 500. Now, the significance of this uh, cumulative demand is that it tells us that up to the end of the third period the total demand for all the periods is 500 units. Similarly, the total demand up to the end of the eighth period is 1500 units and this is how the demand has been fluctuating over the various periods. right? So, this information would be available to us from a demand forecast. We have been talking about demand forecasting in the previous two lectures. So, basically the output of an exercise of this kind would be that we would have access to information like what is the expected demand over the next period. What we are saying here is that there are these are 4 week periods. So, there will be 13 4 week periods in a year 52 weeks. So, we have the demand figures available for all the 13 uh, 4 week periods. So, these are like 4 week periods in that sense and the cumulative demand is 2600 for all these 13 4 week periods that means for the entire year. Now, what we would like to do is to find out that in the face of this uncertain demand what would it be what should be the right policy for the company to produce so that you can meet this uh, kind of demand. And uh, we will approach this problem from an intuitive perspective and we will see how we can uh, solve this particular question. We will use a graphical procedure and incidentally this graphical procedure is the most common one with practical managers because they find it simple and it does not involve any complicated mathematics. right? And obviously, the price is in terms of the fact that this leads to only a heuristic solution, it does not guarantee an optimal solution, but let us it is a it has certain uh, advantages to offer. The first thing that you do in the procedure is that you plot the cumulative demand. So, this solid line which you see here is a plot of the actual cumulative demand that we had in the table. So, you plot the cumulative demand which is shown here and you go up to the 13th period and you have this demand. Now, let us consider two possibilities we call them plan 1 and plan 2. After all what we need is what is a production plan? A production plan is nothing but a path going from this point to this particular point here and any line which goes from here to here is actually a production plan. And since infinite number of lines can be drawn from 0 to this terminal point therefore, there are infinite number of production plans. But normally what is uh, the ideal thing for a production manager? He would not like to vary the quantity that he produces every year. So, the total quantity that is to be produced in 13 periods is 2600. So, if we assume that the constant production level is to be maintained 2600 divided by 13 we should maintain a constant production level of 200 per period and we would have a constant level of production. If you plot this plan this plan is actually shown by this top dotted line. It is a straight line from here to here and that is what it is. Do you notice something about this plan 1 that is constant production? If you plan at a constant production rate, you compare the actual demand forecast with this line, you find that the actual demand forecast for most of the time except somewhere here is below this line. What does it show? It shows that the cumulative production is greater than the cumulative demand, which means if this particular line uh, that is the production line is above the 
accumulated demand line we would have costs of carrying inventories. So, one thing that you can immediately see from this plot is that if we follow this uh, policy of having a constant production level of 200 per unit most of the, in most periods we will be carrying inventories except in some periods there could be a shortage this amount could be calculated as we will do subsequently. So, if the cost of carrying inventory is not too high this should be a good plan because uh, you are uh, most of the time you are not incurring any back orders or shortages and you are carrying inventories and uh, this is what it is. Of course, the one might say that another possible plan may be that you follow this demand line closely which means you produce exactly as per demand that could be a production policy. So, if you produce exactly as per plan what will happen that uh, your cumulative production will exactly follow this and you will neither be carrying inventories nor will there be a shortage, but the kinds of costs that you will involve are cost of changing production rates every period. So, there would be a situation where you would not have to carry any inventories, you would not have to incur any shortages, but you will have to change production every period because you are following the demand, you are chasing the demand. It is actually a chase model and when you are chasing the demand every time you are changing the period there is a cost involved. This cost could be through either hiring and firing or it could be by varying production rates or whatever it is in various ways. So, you would have a situation like this. So, this policy although good in terms of minimizing the costs of carrying and back orders it would not be so good from the point of view of changing the production rates because you will have the cost of changing production rates will be pretty high. Practically you will be changing the production rate every month and this would mean havoc for the production manager you would not like to do this kind of thing. So, you might argue that can we not have a intermediate plan. Now, the intermediate plan could be that rather than uh, changing this uh, production rate every period we have minimum number of changes and uh, then uh, see for instance by looking at this curve you might find for instance that it is going up and there here you could have a policy that let us say up to the fifth month I maintain a constant uh, production rate. So, in these months I am having inventories and in this period I am carrying shortages here. So, the total uh, production here the cumulative uh, demand up to this level is uh, 750. So, 750 divided by 5 is 150. So, the policy is that you carry on the uh, varying production level at a rate of 150 per period during the periods from 1 to 5. So, you get this lower dotted line up to here. Then you can look at this and say maybe up to here from this point to the from the fifth period to the eleventh period you again calculate what the cumulative demand here is and then C uh, divide this by the total number of periods and you get 250 per period is what you produce during the period from 6 to 11. So, your production plan is something like this and in the subsequent periods 12 and 13 which are the last periods you again know that this is what you have to produce. So, you are producing 175 per period during the period from 12 to 13. So, what have we got? what is the advantage? The advantage is that this is like a compromise plan. It shows that there will be some holding inventory, some shortages, but the number of uh, changes in production are limited because during the entire planning horizon first 5 periods we are keeping the production level at 150, then we are changing it to 250 during this period. 
and then we are changing it to 175. So, one slope, next slope, next slope only these three slopes are involved and it involves starting with this production period then only two changes one change here another change here. As compared to the earlier plan that we were talking about where you are changing the production level each time that would be much more costly. right? So, the basic advantage of the graphical procedure is that it helps us to in fact uh, by looking at the demand profile suggest what could be the possible alternative plans and this is the feature that practical managers love most. What they do is they can put down their plan on it and then basically it can be evaluated. So, if you put down a couple of plans on this particular line you can then evaluate them and pick up the best one. Evaluation is generally done in a convenient tabular form like this. We are talking about plan 1 which is constant production. So, production is constant in all the periods and uh, because of the varying uh, we have the demand. So, if you have produced 100 that uh, the demand was 100. So, the inventory at the end of this period is going to be 100 right and uh, the back order is 0 and the capacity change is plus 20. Assuming that the capacity was set for something else the capacity changes so much the overtime is 0 and the subcontracting is also 0 and you compile this table obviously what you notice from the plan uh, the first plan is that there are no back order costs generally uh, there are uh, there is only one capacity change cost there is no overtime cost no subcontracting cost at least in the first 8 months but there are mostly costs of holding inventories. So, depending upon the relative cost of this you can determine what the total cost is right you can uh, Capacity change means that if I am operating at 100 uh, units today and if I change this capacity to 120 in the next period, there is going to be some cost associated with that capacity change that is what it is. So, this plan for instance it does incur some back order costs as I said in the 10th, 11th and 12th periods. So, what you have to basically do is you know these various uh, cost parameters you have to talk about the cost of production, the cost of inventory, the cost of back order, the cost of capacity change, the cost of overtime, the cost of subcontracting and we now know each of these multiply these with the appropriate figures and you will get a rupee figure here. So, you will know what is the total rupee value in terms of the various types of costs involved for this particular plan. We can do an exactly similar exercise for the second plan. What was the second plan? We were keeping the production constant up to the fifth period up to 150, then it was 250 and thereafter it was 175 in the last two periods right. So, we had. So, you can calculate similarly the inventory, the back orders, the capacity changes, the overtimes and the subcontracting which is necessary course this is all based on a certain set of assumptions we will talk about them in a short while and ultimately even for this plan you will have this. So, the inventory costs here are 0 back order is there some capacity change that means a reduction in capacity over time costs subcontracting all these costs are there. So, if you know the relative values of these particular costs you can find out this particular component this is the basic framework that you can follow for analyzing a plan. So, you can compare plan 1 with plan 2 with plan 3 find out the overall costs and then take a plan which is the best for your use. So, this is why this is how the graphical method will actually be a way of choosing the best plan out of the ones that you have been trying to that you have evaluated that you have listed. So, if you have not listed the optimal plan obviously, you will not get the optimal plan right. So, it is a heuristic procedure, but it is good in the sense that it tries to consider all the costs involved. Now, in the carrying out those computations some assumptions were made which are quite commonly followed all shortages were assumed to be backlogged which means that we did not have any loss sales if there was a shortage of 20 we said that it is backlogged. 
regular time capacity was taken to be 200 units per period. The maximum overtime capacity was taken to be 20 percent of the regular capacity. So, 20 percent would mean that the maximum overtime was 40 units per period. Overtime is generally preferable to subcontracting that was an assumption. See normally you would tend to produce something on regular time followed by something on overtime and if you cannot make it on overtime then you will subcontract that is the idea. So, the relative preference was regular time, overtime and subcontracting. Assumed initial inventory was 0, the initial regular time production capacity was 180. So, these were the figures that were assumed that last year the company was operating at an initial capacity of 180. So, that this year if you want to produce 200, you have to change the production capacity to 200. So, the production capacity change costs are plus 20 and that is what you found in the table. So, you will always have a set of situations something like this and you can use the graphical procedure which is the simplest method of aggregate production planning to actually identify the best plan of action for your situation. However, the biggest limitation with the graphical procedure is that it does not give us an optimal solution. It does not give us the solution which has the minimum cost and uh, therefore, we have procedures which in fact uh, are dependent to a very large extent on the nature of costs and uh, depending upon the nature of costs, we can choose an appropriate solution procedure. For instance, if you have a situation like this where the production cost in a particular period say x t is the production in period t and c t x t is the production cost. If this is linear that means, it passes through the origin. It is like saying that the slope of this line is the cost per piece. Right? So, if it is whatever is the cost like this, it is a linear production cost. Similarly, the inventory cost, the inventory cost could be of two kinds. It could be a situation where the inventory is positive, which is the holding cost. The situation when the inventory is negative, which is the shortage cost, because what is positive inventory? you are holding stocks. What is negative in inventory? You have items on back order. So, it will be one of the two situations. Either I can supply immediately 20 cars if I have more stocked with me. So, it is a situation where the inventory level is high and if there is any demand less than this, I can supply it off hand. But in this case, there is a shortage. So, I back order. Right? If I somebody places an order for 20 cars and I do not have 20 cars in stock, I will say okay, the next 2 months I will manufacture these 20 cars and supply them to you. That is back ordering cost, but back order is also at a cost. Right? It is in terms of loss of goodwill, whatever it is. So, there are these costs which are determined by the slopes. So, suppose Maruti has allocated some land for uh, storing manufactured cars. So, if the inventory is 0 or if inventory is 100, then what difference, the difference does it make? Sir? Because even if it is 0, the land is lying unused and even if we store 100 cars, so there would not be any extra cost on that. Uh, you can look at it this way, that if it has allocated some additional land, if it is not stocking something and some cars on it, he can probably give it on rent and earn revenue on that particular land which it is forfeiting by putting some cars on stock. So, in that sense, it is a potential loss of an opportunity which is a cost that is what it is right. So, it would always be a situation of this nature. So, if you have linear costs of this kind that is production costs are linear and the inventory costs are also linear, then you can use uh, linear programming for solving this problem. You can use a simplified transportation model or you can use a transportation model for solving this particular problem. I am just trying to give you an overview of the various solution procedures. In the next lecture, we shall go into the details of how these models can be applied for determining the optimal solution. Right?
But the point here is that these solution procedures that we have identified here are valid only if the cost structure is linear for both production costs and for inventory holding and shortage costs. Then you can use any of these procedures. On the other hand, if costs are convex, <coughs> this is now a case when all the costs are convex. What do you mean by convex costs? That is the production cost is something like this. What does it mean? That if you produce the first unit, uh, the cost is less. As you keep on producing more units, the cost keeps on increasing. When do you think this would be a relevant thing to happen? This would happen for instance when initially you have lower costs and subsequently below, uh, beyond a certain production level the costs are higher. So, if you are talking about regular time production, overtime production and uh, subcontracting, the cost slopes would be progressively increasing piecewise linear in that sense. right? So, those costs are therefore convex. In a convex cost, if you join any two points on this cost function, the line segment lies wholly above this particular cost. Right? That is how you define a convex cost function. Similarly, you will find that the inventory costs are also convex. This is convex, this is convex. In a situation like this, where the costs of production, costs of inventory are convex, Again, you can use a transportation model, but after piecewise linearization. Piecewise linearization is quite common, regular time, over time, subcontracting. The cost will increase per unit. Or another very classic example of convex cost is uh, a model due to Holt, Modigliani, Muth and Simon, four people and they have developed what are known as linear decision rules or LDRs and they are typically valid for convex costs of this kind and in fact what has uh, what they have assumed is that this is based on a case study in a paint manufacturing company and for that paint manufacturing company they have approximated all costs as quadratic costs of this type is a quadratic function, quadratic function. And when you differentiate a quadratic function, you get linear functions. So, the solution that you get is a linear decision rule. That is how the term comes about. We will uh, have a quick glance at this particular method. If the costs are concave and piecewise concave, this is the most complicated category of costs mathematically. You are saying that the cost is first increasing and then flattening out. So, what happens is this is like economies of scale. The more you produce, the lesser is the cost per unit. right? Similarly, for inventory costs, you have this behavior. And for concave and piecewise concave costs, we can use dynamic programming for determining a solution or we can use a network flow solution, which is based on the shortest path in a network developed by Wagner and Witten. In fact, uh, it is Wagner and Witten. So, it should be Wagner and Witten. Right? Now, just to give you an idea of these linear decision rules, let us quickly run through this example. This was a study done by Holt, Modi, Glani, Muth and Simon in, the in 1955 on a large paint manufacturing unit and what they did was they defined these variables W t is the workforce level in period t, t going from 1 to capital T, x t is the aggregate production level in period t and then we have i t is the actual production net inventory at the end of period t and i t star is the ideal aggregate net inventory at the end of period t. So, what is done in this particular model is that various types of costs are modeled. How they are modeled? Say regular time payroll cost. What is the regular time payroll cost? It will have a fixed component and a variable component like this. 
So, this is the workforce W t number of workers in period t. So, this cost is modeled by C 1 W t plus C 13 which is a constant. So, C 1 C 13 are constants. Similarly, workforce change cost workforce change cost is something like this. This is for shortage and this is for holding inventory. So, you have W t minus W t minus 1 is the increase or decrease in workforce. So, this is the hiring cost, this is the firing cost. They approximate this function by this quadratic component and this quadratic component is written as C 2 W t minus W t 1 minus C 11 whole square. So, this is how they model the workforce change cost, convex cost. Then the overtime cost, overtime cost will also be that beyond this level the cost goes up. So, this is approximated by this particular function and it is x t minus c 4 w t whole square multiplied with c 3 plus c 5 x t minus c 6 x into w t plus c 12 into x t w t. You see it is nothing but a function of all x t and w t. So, the x t minus w t whole square x t term w t term and the product of the two terms all the components are there with the various parameters. Now, these parameters will have to be determined from the actual costs of the company. Similarly, inventory related costs which are of this nature are approximated by a uh, function which is quadratic of this type and then you have C 1 i t minus i t star whole square which is equal to C 7 into i t minus C 8 minus C 9 into d t where d t is the demand for the tth period whole square and these are all the costs and then this was just to give you an idea that once you sum up all these costs and you take partial derivatives with respect to w 1 star and x 1 star which are your variables you will get linear functions of d t w 0 i 0. So, what really happens is that w 1 star w x 1 star are now coming out to be linear functions of d t w naught i naught in the previous period. Similarly, w 2 x 2 will be linear functions of w 1 x 1 and so on. So, those are the linear decision rules that this particular model is actually trying to use. There are a number of other methods to handle aggregate planning, aggregate production planning these are some of the models which are available in the literature for solving aggregate production planning problems of this type. So, a very common formulation is a linear programming formulation. So, if the costs are linear you can easily write down an LP to represent the costs and the various constraints. What would be the constraints? The constraints would simply, simply be inventory balance equations. I have so much, I produce so much, I sell so much and therefore, at the end of the period I have so much. This kind of a constraint will have to be written for each period that is the inventory balance equation, conservation of mass equations. right? So, then any other constraints that you may have and then the costs that we have discussed that will constitute your objective function. So, this is the typical LP model formulation. Search decision rules was one category of procedures which were actually determined by Taubert in the sense that you talked about one type of rule another type of rule that you are using and you can then uh, talk about a combination of these rules. It is like rule 1 into alpha plus rule 2 into 1 minus alpha and you are trying to basically search with what particular value of alpha you would have a rule which would give you an appropriate kind of uh, solution. These have not produced to not uh, come out to be very popular in aggregate production planning. Goal programming formulation is an extension of linear programming and it would be useful when you are dealing with multiple goals. Parametric production planning is a procedure developed by Jones in which basically uh, some parameters are introduced which can change over certain periods and uh, through the process of optimization 
you are actually determining the values of those parameters that is the basic idea and a management coefficients model is an approach in which you basically try to talk to different managers and find out what is the optimum strategy and then you try to find out uh, something like uh, a weighted average of the methods that are suggested or the strategies that are suggested by different managers right which might happen for instance we give you the example of uh, the graphical procedure we had two plans so one could be possibility of product one, um, manager one it could be second one could be the uh, idea of manager two so what you can do is if you thought of maybe 75 percent confidence in this manager and 25 percent confidence in the other manager you could take the two plans and find out what would be the production quantity in individual period something like that so that would be the approach that you would follow to determine this so there are a variety of methods for solving the aggregate production planning problem to conclude let us summarize what we have tried to see in this particular lecture we have seen that aggregate production planning is relevant for fluctuating demands for medium term horizons <coughs> typically in the range of 6 months to 1 year I think that is uh, one key factor that you have to understand that basically it is the horizon of 6 months to 1 year that we are trying to see and we are talk talking about the fluctuating demand of the company and we are trying to see how the resources should be allocated to meet that fluctuating demand this is the problem so this is the problem that we have been trying to see a simple graphical procedure that generates good solutions by examining the demand pattern was presented it was simple in the sense that you could pose a procedure and then just find out what is the cost of that procedure that was the idea and there could be various ways to meet a fluctuating demand it could be through hiring firing through storing inventories through shortages through back orders etc so we saw that there were a variety of ways in fact the very fact that there are a variety of ways that is why the optimization problem is so intense you have to find out what is the best way and uh, finally we had taken a, an example of uh, solution procedures including the linear decision rules where basically the costs were convex and uh, because they were modeled by a quadratic function when you differentiated the cost function you actually landed up with linear decision rules and uh, this was one approach now in the next lecture we shall be talking about some specific procedures that are used for optimizing the production plan that is finding out what is the best way to determine the production plan thank you Thank you.